Hello there, I'm Manila Chan. You're watching In Question, broadcasting from RT America's National News Headquarters in Washington, D.C. Here are tonight's top stories. First, the Biden administration is aiming to end U.S. support of Saudi Arabia's intervention in Yemen. We'll bring you those details next in a full report. Plus, Kremlin officials blasted the U.S., accusing the American government of meddling in their domestic affairs as it relates to opposition leader Alexei Navalny. We're going to discuss it. Then, 33 missing children, including eight who were sexually exploited, were rescued in Southern California after a multi-agency investigation called Operation Lost Angels. A live report is just moments away. All right, it's time to boost your news IQ. After years of supporting Saudi Arabia's ruthless military campaign in Yemen, there's now hope that the Biden administration will remove the U.S. from the mix. RT's Alex Mihailovich has that story. It is a conflict that President Joe Biden has promised to get the U.S. out of. And a situation that many say was made worse by the Trump administration as the former president exited the White House. I'm extremely concerned about the impact of the decision from the United States to designate Ansar Allah as a foreign terrorist organization. Adding to the military support that the U.S. has given Saudi Arabia in Yemen, less than two weeks ago, Donald Trump's government designated Yemen's Houthi rebels a terrorist group, a move that has caused protests in Yemen and that President Biden's nominee for Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, disagrees with. It seems to uh, achieve nothing particularly practical in advancing the uh, uh, efforts against uh, the Houthis and to bring them back to uh, the negotiating table. While many choose to call the conflict in Yemen a proxy war between Saudi Arabia, which wants to restore a Saudi sympathetic government, and Iran, which supports the Houthis, the situation is far more complex. The conflict is rooted in an unsuccessful post-Arab Spring political transition that went bad in 2011. By 2014, the country was in a downward spiral of sectarian violence, jihadist attacks, and a separatist movement, fueled by government corruption, high unemployment, and food scarcity. Believing that the Houthis, a Shia Muslim population, were backed by Iran, Saudi Arabia and friends entered the arena. To this day, the Saudis are leading a coalition against the Houthis. Coalition countries have included the United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, Sudan, and Egypt while the U.S., France, and the U.K. have helped with logistics and arms. The group is responsible for all air attacks in Yemen since it joined the battle more than five years ago. The Saudi-led campaign um, in Yemen um, to push back against the, the Houthi aggression um, has contributed to what is, uh, by most accounts, the worst humanitarian situation that we face uh, anywhere in the world. Yemen is the poorest country in the Middle East, along with the conflict and disease, 10 million people are said to be going hungry in Yemen. Currently, about 80% of the population of Yemen live in areas controlled by the Houthis. According to Antony Blinken, designating the Houthi movement a terrorist group may impede the distribution of humanitarian assistance, which is desperately needed by millions in Yemen. As for the U.S. military backing of Saudi Arabia, American lawmakers on both sides of the aisle have voiced opposition to Washington's logistical support and arms sales to the Saudis. And while on the campaign trail, Joe Biden joined the call. This past October, he released this statement in which he says, Under a Biden-Harris administration, we will reassess our relationship with the kingdom, end U.S. support for Saudi Arabia's war in Yemen, and make sure America does not check its values at the door to sell arms or buy oil. Now, many believe that it's time to put words into action and move towards ending America's participation in the war in Yemen. For RT, I'm Alex Mihailovich. Thousands of protesters took to the streets of Russia to demand the release of opposition leader Alexei Navalny. Clashes broke out between riot police and protesters, resulting in hundreds of arrests. According to published reports, right before the protests occurred, the U.S. Embassy in Moscow issued an alert warning American citizens to avoid the demonstrations and even named the venues where the protests were about to take place. 
Russia says the publication of that alert was inappropriate and inadvertently the U.S. meddled with their domestic affairs. Navalny was detained on January 17th upon his return to Russia from Germany, where he spent almost five months recovering from alleged poisoning. He's set to appear in court next week for a hearing. And this week, the White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki issued a blunt demand to the Russian government, a call for the immediate and unconditional release of Alexei Navalny, prominent critic of President Vladimir Putin. This as the new Biden administration says they are interested in opening bilateral talks to extend the New START treaty due to expire in just a few weeks. For more on this, we will go to Jeremy Kuzmarov. He's the managing editor of Covert Action magazine and author of the book, The Russians Are Coming Again. Uh, I still want to call you professor, so that might come out. Professor Jeremy Kuzmarov is here. Uh, good to see you. Um, first of all, Professor Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov fired back, saying the U.S. is meddling in their country's internal affairs and the U.S. is supporting lawbreakers within the Federation. How do you view the battle of the spokespeople in Washington and Moscow? Well, this case has been very politicized, uh, and I think Russia does have a point whether they're correct in their treatment of Navalny or not, they do have a point that the United States should stay out. I mean, there is the issue of, of state sovereignty, and Russia has, you know, should have the right to deal with their affairs and problems without the United States, you know, taking a stand on the issue. I mean, that could be very dangerous and, and provocative from, from the Russian government point of view. And the United States doesn't want, you know, Russia meddling or commenting on internal affairs in the United States. So, uh, you know, there should be a... I mean, Russia is justified in that respect because uh, the United States would feel the same way yeah, and in their on, position. On that note, that's exactly right. Jen Psaki, the press secretary, echoed the sentiments of the State Department this weekend, condemning the arrests of many protesters and even journalists who participated in these Navalny protests just a few days ago. So why would she issue such a statement when just months ago the U.S. did the very same thing here during BLM protests? which saw even reporters being arrested live on TV, live on air. Isn't that pretty hypocritical? Well, I think so, yeah. I mean, Russia, again, uh, you know, doesn't want the United States meddling in their affairs or commenting uh, on developments within their country as the United States doesn't want Russia doing the same. So, and I mean, there is, you know, a, a pattern here. The United States, for instance, you know, in the Cold War was supporting Soviet dissidents. The United States clearly dislikes Vladimir Putin, has been, you know, uh, Navalny has been kind of darling in the Western media. There are allegations of U.S. support for him. Those haven't been corroborated, but the U.S. clearly has been encouraging the opposition to Putin and dislikes Putin, you know, who's a strong Russian nationalist and has stood up against certain American interests. So there's a very clear political agenda in trying to support Navalny and undermine Putin. So you can clearly see why Russia would be uh, upset about all this. Would you compare this action similar to, to like the color revolutions we saw in neighboring Georgia and perhaps even Ukraine? Yes, and also Belarus. The United States over the last 20, 25 years has supported, starting in Serbia against Milosevic, many of these color revolutions where they support the opposition and they you know, present the opposition movements usually to pro-Russian governments as these, you know, led by Democrats and these leaders like in Georgia, it was Mikhail Saakashvili. He was presented as this great beacon of democracy. But Saakashvili proved to be very corrupt, and he started a war with Russia. And a lot of the leaders the U.S. has supported are very unsavory. And there are big question marks about Navalny and whether he's an opportunist. And he's had some so association with far-right-wing groups in Russia. And he generally promoted a fairly conservative economic program. And, you know, maybe more the interests of the United States uh, he would uphold rather than Russian uh, state interests. So... Uh, this very well may be fitting the pattern that we've seen before. And, you know, Russia has a right to be suspicious, given what's happened on yeah. its borders, uh, that there's an effort by the United States to try and overthrow the Putin government and trigger a color revolution. And Belarus, you know, Navalny has supported the leader, the opposition movement in Belarus, 
which has received a lot of funding from the National Endowment for Democracy, trying to overthrow the pro-socialist, pro-Russian government um, of Lukashenko in Belarus. Yeah. And, and how do you view Navalny's role in how the U.S. will engage with Russia on the New START treaty? Will Navalny be kind of used as a bargaining chip? He could be, yeah. People, you know, uh, Russia hawks uh, could stand up and say, you know, we don't want to forge any alliance with Russia uh, or make any agreement with them. I think there's also the issue of the Nord Stream pipeline. And the Volney case is being used by elements in Europe and the United States to try and block the Nord Stream pipeline, a gas pipeline uh, from Russia to Germany from going forward, and also to ratchet up sanctions against Russia, uh, which are uh, harmful to Russia and unjustified. And I'd like to add that there's no proof uh, established that Navalny was poisoned or poisoned by Russia. The, the case with this poisoning is very murky and has been very politicized, you know, is being used to advance uh, a Cold War political agenda. Yeah, we should definitely point out that it was the Russians who were asking the Germans to share their uh, medical information, to which the German government has yet declined. So we'll see uh, how that shakes out if they ever do cooperate on this full in, uh, cooperation. Uh, Jeremy Kuzmarov, good to see you. Thank you for weighing in on this. Thanks for having me. Now, more and more Republican senators are saying they're opposing holding an impeachment trial against former President Donald Trump. This, in effect, diminishes the likelihood that GOP senators will join Democrats in convicting him for inciting a siege on the U.S. Capitol. House Democrats are expected to walk the impeachment charge of incitement of insurrection to the Senate this evening. And it appears the U.S. and France are patching things up. On Sunday, President Biden called French President Emmanuel Macron and expressed his desire to re-strengthen bilateral ties. This, of course, following a rocky relationship between the two countries under the Trump administration. According to a White House press release, the two leaders agreed to coordinate their responses to climate change, COVID-19, and the global economic recovery. They also agreed to work together on shared foreign policy priorities. And the Prime Minister of Italy, Giuseppe Conti, is set to resign Tuesday after losing a majority in the Senate. This according to a government spokesman. The resignation could lead to a snap election in the midst of political instability and as the country is struggling with a possible third wave of the virus and a dire need to revive their economy. And Iran is reportedly setting out seven preconditions to the United States in order to resume talks on the country's nuclear program. According to a Kuwaiti publication, the information was laid out by an official from Iran's presidential office who remains unidentified. The official added that contact with the administration began before Joe Biden's ascension to office, implying talks are continuing but unofficial. It must be noted, though, that none of this has been confirmed by U.S. officials. And 33 missing children, including eight who were sexually exploited, were rescued in Southern California after a multi-agency investigation called Operation Lost Angels. Details are straight ahead. Then, later at the Sports HQ, Regina Hamm shares one team's quest to end their slump in Australia's A-League. And remember to keep up with all the latest news and catch up with anything you might have missed. Download the Portable TV app where you can watch us anytime you want. We'll be right back. It's very real and becoming more and more common here in the United States. We're talking about human trafficking. The $150 billion industry is considered modern day slavery, selling underaged youth into the trade. And now several sting operations are coming to light throughout the country. RT correspondent Natasha Sweet is joining us from the LA studio where dozens of young vi victims were recently recovered in the area, Natasha? 
Yeah, that's right, Manila. A whopping 33 victims who are children have been identified through a multi-agency operation called Los Angeles. And according to the FBI, eight of those victims were being sexually exploited when the arrests were being made. And two of those victims were recovered multiple times during the operation. Called Los Angeles, the operation began on January 11th, lasting through Friday. It was a sting set up in Los Angeles, comprising of the FBI and some two dozen other agencies. Several of the victims had been sexually abused in the past and were considered vulnerable missing children. Advocates say now during the pandemic, this horrific crime is starting from victims' homes. Children's risk has increased as they are spending time online for school, where many predators decide to take the lead. It is the biggest moneymaker. It rivals the number one crime, the drug trade, which many law enforcement and sources of mine tell me actually human trafficking has now become the number one crime because it is much easier to traffic a person than to traffic drugs. New data reveals caseloads for both sex and labor trafficking related crimes has risen over the past few years. In November of 2020, more than 1,800 active trafficking investigations were still pending. And roughly two hours just north of Los Angeles, three suspects were taken into custody last week in Bakersfield. Well, those arrests were made at the Desert Star Motel. And studies reveal in Bakersfield alone, up to 1,000 women are being sold on a monthly basis. Eight out of 10 of them are reportedly not there by choice. And now this operation comes just two months after another 27 underage victims were recovered in Virginia. Many of those runaways and also teens in the other foster care system. Now, Manila, it's important to point out that January is National Human Trafficking Prevention Month, a time to highlight a crime that's often misunderstood. Reporting for In Question, Natasha Sweets, RT. Now, it's going to be another busy week for the Biden administration. There are new reports the Biden team will impose new travel restrictions for Europe as well as South Africa for non-U.S. citizens flying into the states. Now, South Africa is now the latest country to join the list over concerns about a new highly contagious and potentially even more deadly variant of the coronavirus. Arte's Trinity Chavez has more from New York. President Biden will reinstate the COVID-19 travel restrictions for non-U.S. citizens entering the country from Brazil, Ireland, the United Kingdom, and much of Europe. The president will also extend the restrictions to anyone traveling from South Africa in a bid to contain the new variant of COVID-19. In light of the new COVID variants that we're, you're learning about, we're instituting now a new measure for individuals flying into the United States from other countries. Starting Saturday, the Biden administration will ban most non-U.S. citizens from entering the U.S. who have recently traveled to South Africa, as well as reimpose a ban on almost all non-U.S. citizens and travelers who have visited Brazil, the U.K., and Ireland, along with 26 other countries across Europe. It's all a part of an effort to contain the spread of new variants that have cropped up around the globe. We emphasize that no matter what virus is circulating, virus variants or not, we have to do everything we can to reduce transmission. The U.S. also reporting its own COVID variant. Researchers at Cedar sinai Medical Center in California say the variant known as Cal-20C was barely detectable in October, but by late December, it accounted for 24% of virus samples taken from patients. Los Angeles County, now one of the nation's coronavirus hotspots with more than a million cases and 14,000 deaths. Medical experts say the new variant may be partially responsible for the magnitude of the surge. Hospitals across the country still struggling to keep up. You'll have more hospitalizations and you'll have uh, more people, uh, an overburdened in healthcare system. And in a situation where you have an overburdened healthcare system, you can have increased deaths. The race to get people vaccinated now even more urgent. Still, though, PPE and other medical supplies are dwindling in hospitals coast to coast. Senior members of President Biden's health team say they hope vaccine supplies will increase in the coming months. But in this uh, time period now, when we have probably perhaps the most limited supply that we may experience over the next few months, uh, we've got to pull out the stop. So what does that mean? Well, it means, number one, ensuring that we're not holding back a second doses of, of the vaccine. It also means using the Defense Production Act to ensure that we are and, you know, producing the components of the vaccines that are absolutely needed, as well as the right types 
uh, materials for administration. This while Moderna says its COVID-19 vaccine appears to be protective against emergent variants of the coronavirus in laboratory tests, but as a precaution, it will start testing whether a booster shot improves immune responses and is developing a new vaccine targeting the strain first identified in South Africa. And as anxiety continues to build across the nation over the pandemic, this past weekend, the Chicago Teachers Union voted to defy an order to return to the classroom over concerns about COVID-19. District officials have said the move would amount to an illegal strike, but hopes to reach an agreement with the union as soon as possible. Reporting in New York, Trinity Chavez, RT. Now to the latest COVID-19 numbers worldwide. Those cases now topping 99 million with more than 2 million deaths. The U.S. is still leading the way with, with the most confirmed cases, followed by India and then Brazil. Back here stateside, that number of cases topping 25 million with just over 419,000 reported deaths. And Mexico's president, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, is now working from isolation after testing positive for COVID-19. This comes as Mexico is recording its highest levels of infections and deaths. Lopez Obrador's symptoms are reportedly mild. And after speaking with the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, the Mexican president was able to secure 24 million doses of the Russian Sputnik vaccine, even though it hasn't technically been approved for use in Mexico. And then over to Brazil now, where thousands of protesters there took to the streets for a second day to call for the impeachment of President Jair Bolsonaro for his response to the pandemic. People in cars honked their horns and paraded through major city streets demanding he step down. Bolsonaro has faced renewed criticism in recent weeks for the delay in immunization and the collapse of the health system. And Israel is planning to close its international airport to nearly all flights to get the pandemic under control and keep out the highly contagious variants of the virus. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says the closure, which still needs parliamentary legislation to be finalized, would remain in effect for at least one week. New cases continue to climb even as the country rolled out its massive vaccination campaign. Meantime, ultra-Orthodox students clashed with Israeli police in two major cities, protesting new coronavirus restrictions imposed in religious communities. And heading over to Regina Hamm at the Sports HQ. Regina, uh, one team over at A-League is hoping their current situation isn't how the whole season's going to roll out. Thankfully, it is early, but you know, the start of the A-League season, well, it's not really going quite as planned for the Newcastle Jets. They've lost four consecutive matches as they faced off against the Wellington Phoenix. They hoped their streak of bad luck would come to an end. Eighth minute Newcastle ready from the get-go. Roy O'Donovan with a pass to Valentino Guell. He is just gone as far as Wellington is concerned. Down in the box, finishes the shot. Third goal of the season, first goal for Newcastle. Blink, you're going to miss this one from UL. What a missile. Second half, 50th minute this time. O'Donovan is going to be the goal scorer. He takes the ball all the way down the pitch and his shot Sales past Stefan Marovic, who is out of the box, Newcastle, with a 2-0 lead. Steven Jotrovic with the through ball to O'Donovan. He's out of here, ladies and gentlemen, to score his 50th career A-League goal. One, Wellington will have a penalty shot here in the 85th minute. Ulysses Davia converts it to put the Kiwis on the board, but they still fall in stoppage time. 2-1 in Newcastle, the first win of the season. American snowboarder Chloe Kim made headlines in the sports world back in 2018 at Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. She became the youngest Olympic halfpipe champ at 17 years old. Now in her first competition in 22 months, she hoped to strap in and earn her way back to the top of the podium at the LAAX Open. Despite falling on her first trick, Kim's second run was the best performance of the night. She's competing in a field that included Spanish snowboarder Kirok, Castellet, and Kim, though, is also returning after rehabbing a broken ankle and finishing her first year in college. She needed to top Japan's Mitsuka Ono with a score higher than 76.5 to end up on top of the podium, and there was no rustiness here, as you see. She dialed in her front size 1080 and earned a score of 89.75 for the first place spot. She now has to look forward to preparing for her fifth X Games in Aspen, where she's also looking to take the title. And on the men's side, Ruka Hirano from Japan earned his third place position while battling against Aussie Scotty James for silver, but fellow Japanese snowboarder Yuto Totsuka with the best run of the night, earning himself the first place position. And if that wasn't amazing enough, check out this street feat of strength. 17-year-old Jack Wadman is uh, no ordinary teenager as he takes powerlifting 
to a larger and new level. He has a weightlifting tool of choice. Well, that happens to be pulling trucks, tractor trailers, and vans with nothing but a length of rope and pretty much just sheer willpower in order to perform these pretty impressive feats. Wadman eats a diet that includes 24, yes, 24 pints of milk, and his diet tends to cost his family over $1,300 a month. He's gone viral for his powerlifting tricks in hopes that he can go professional and follow in the footsteps of another famous European powerlifter, Arnold Schwarzenegger. That is impressive. That is a tractor trailer he is pulling, Manila, and I, I kind of am very surprised. <laughs> I'm in awe. Okay, what is up lately with all of these really young, <laughs> like a 10-year-old powerlifter in Iran? I think she mm -hmm. was in Tehran. Yep. And now this teenage boy pulling big old trucks. I mean, <laughs> what is in the water these days? Are they just making them bigger? Maybe. I think, you know, also in the pandemic, what else is there to do? Take but up a new things. hobby, but lift weight. I mean, pick things up. We all law on their quarantine 15. Maybe they're just trying to prevent that. And you know what? Good for them. I'm well, impressed. Yes, <laughs> I'm, I'm very impressed. I just wonder if there's something in the water that these Ooh, kids are drinking. Maybe I'll have all that milk. Them, please. <laughs> all that milk. All right, Regina Ham, thank you for that. That's going to do it for us right now. Make sure you keep up with everything in question at all times by downloading the Portable TV app so you can watch us anytime you want. Follow me on Twitter and Telegram too now at Manila Chan. Thanks for watching. I'll see you back here soon.